so this is the outline that I, I want to go over that I'm, uh, for the talk that I'll give this afternoon. First of all, I'll briefly describe why we need predictors of cardiovascular events, uh, and then talk about some potential modalities, uh, focusing first on the Framingham risk score, which is the best validated uh, met model for uh, identifying uh, cardiovascular risk in populations. Uh, talk a little bit about cal coronary calcium scoring, partly because it's popular, partly because there is some evidence that suggests that it might be helpful in some patients. Uh, and then talk about uh, uh, inflammatory biomarkers, uh, particularly C-reactive protein, which I'm sure you've all heard a lot about and probably get a lot of lab test uh, requests for, uh, and a combination of uh, inflammatory markers or multi-markers to see if those add to risk predicted by Framingham score. Uh, then I'll address the issue as to whether there might be better uh, marker, markers for lipid-associated risk, uh, a little bit about uh, apolipoproteins B and A1 uh, as compared to uh, more traditional lipid measures of total and HDL cholesterol. And then finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that if Framingham risk scoring uh, works, how come we don't use it more? And uh, are there, is there a simple way that we might be able to uh, increase its utilization in our practices, uh, particularly here at the university, and then finally conclude? So why is uh, coronary heart dis disease an important target for screening in people who haven't yet developed the disease? Well, it's, uh, there's a tremendous economic cost associated with coronary heart disease, about $133 billion per year in the U.S. It accounts for over 2 million hospitalizations per year in the United States. In addition, uh, there are about 850,000 myocardial infarctions suffered by individuals in the United States per year, and about 660,000 deaths per year that are attributable to coronary heart disease. Now, uh, it is important, I think, here to note that even though the absolute rates of car cardiovascular death have been decreasing over the last uh, 40 years in the United States, it's still the number one uh, cause of death in, uh, in Americans. And it's particularly a disease that uh, can uh, attack a number of people uh, in their uh, most productive years of life. And then finally, one of the main reasons that we want to identify risk uh, for cardiovascular disease before people have a cardiovascular event is that the first MI is fatal in about a third of cases. So that's a pretty high price of admission to treatment if you require somebody to have myocardial infarction uh, before you begin it. Now, uh, Dari Morzafarian, who is a cardiology fellow here and now is on the faculty at Harvard, uh, published an article uh, a couple of years ago in JAMA uh, listing the features of an effective uh, screening test. There are disease-related features that uh, make a test helpful, and then there are test-related features. The, the disease-related features are first that the disease should be common, uh, that it should have an extended preclinical stage, and that there are therapies available that can uh, reduce or prevent mortality and morbidity. And I think it's uh, inherently obvious to all of us in the room that cardiovascular disease meets all three of these criteria. What about the test itself? Well, first of all, it must be uh, uh, accurately uh, accurate in classifying a diagnosis, accurate in identifying both those that are at increased risk and those that are not at increased risk for the disease. It should be practical in that it should be safe cost-effective and widely available, and I'll show you some of the things that I'm going to uh, discuss this afternoon aren't, uh, don't necessarily meet all of those criteria. And then finally, uh, it, it should be ethical to do the test and that it should be justifiable after accounting for intended and unintended consequences. Now what about some of these potential modal modalities? I'm going to focus first on the Framingham risk score. Now, the Framingham study is a very interesting epidemiologic study that was begun in the late 40s in a small town outside Boston. It's unique in that about 67% or 68.5% of the adults between the ages of 29 and 62 in that town in the late 50s were uh, recruited into this test. So it's a, it was a very nice look at, a, at the broad spectrum of people in that uh, population. These people have been followed for a long period of time, and now uh, they're well into uh, following the, the uh, first and second generation offspring of the original uh, participants in the Framingham cohort. 
In 1961, uh, Cannell and colleagues uh, published uh, the major risk factors that they identified in that population for coronary heart disease. And they include um, uh, age, gender, total cholesterol, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, and then evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy by ECG. Now, most of these have been included into uh, the uh, Framingham risk scoring that we do today. Uh, LVH by ECG isn't a part of the standard Framingham risk scoring uh, as it's uh, performed currently. But on, one important thing that they demonstrated in this study is that there was an additive relationship between risk factors and risk uh, with, uh, ad for uh, predicting coronary disease. Uh, on this slide, for example, they show the relationship of systolic blood pressure to coronary heart disease risk uh, based on different levels of cholesterol. So that for any, as you can see, for any given level of cholesterol, there is a graded increase in coronary heart disease risk as cholesterol levels increase. But uh, as you can also see that for any given level of blood pressure, there's an increase in risk as cholesterol levels increase. Now, these have been incorporated today in Framingham risk modeling, uh, and the current risk model includes these seven factors. Gender, age, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, systolic blood pressure, uh, whether or not the patients are on hypertensive, uh, antihypertensive treatment, and whether or not they're current smokers. When you plug these into the model, what do you get? You get an estimate of the 10-year risk of death or non-fatal myocardial infarction. Now, what are some of the caveats of this study uh, of, of using Framingham? First of all, this is a model that's designed to predict risk of coronary heart disease in people who don't yet have it. So it's inappropriate to apply it in people who already have established coronary heart disease. And secondly, uh, there are groups of people who we now understand to be at such high risk for coronary heart disease a priori uh, that we should treat them as having the same risk as people with established coronary heart disease. And so some of these coronary heart disease risk equivalents include people who have diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, uh, peripheral vascular disease, or who have uh, who've had a, 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 an embolic stroke. Again, one of the other problems with this is that it does estimate 10-year risk, but I don't know about you, Mike, but I, I want to live to 100, so I'd like to know what my risk is over the next, next 50 years. Um, and uh, thirdly, it's a mono-ethnic population, and so it's not, the results aren't necessarily applicable to other ethnic groups. And finally, it does focus on these two very important endpoints, death and non-fatal myocardial infarction, but there are other cardiovascular events that are certainly of interest to to uh, you and me, including angina, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease. And it is the case that in some recent studies of Framingham, they have expanded the definition of cardi coronary heart disease events to include some of these other uh, important cardiovascular uh, morbidities. Now, what about coronary calcium scoring? Uh, here's uh, an example of what one uh, obtains with a coronary uh, uh, calcium how one obtains a coronary calcium score. Uh, a CT scan is done that can attain uh, images in a rapid fashion. So that can be done either with an electron beam CT or with a multi-slice mechanical CT scanners, 4-slice, 16-slice, or 64-slice that now are available at many centers today. Uh, and and uh, shown in the uh, picture on the left is an image from the CT scan at the level of the coronary arteries. And the white arrow points to white, bright calcification in the left anterior descending coronary artery. So with this technique, you, not, you can not only identify the presence of calcium fairly readily, but you can actually quantify the amount of calcium present as well. So this has been uh, diffused widely into the community, and there are a lot of places that you can uh, go right now to get uh, your coronary artery calcium score. In fact, there are, place down, there are places downtown where you can get it done for $100. But I, I think the question is that does, while calcium is a component of atherosclerotic plaques, and so it does identify the presence of atherosclerotic disease, does it add to risk? So I think probably the best way 
to think about applying any of these therapies is to see what they add to their already established gold standard of Framingham score. So here's a nice study uh, that was published by Phil Greenland and colleagues uh, about three years ago in JAMA. Uh, they looked at uh, the South Bay Heart Watch uh, population, which has about 1,200 people who were at moderate risk for coronary disease uh, and uh, follow, have been followed for up to 10 years. At baseline, they collected the risk factors and calculated their Framingham risk scores, which are shown on the uh, x-axis. And then over seven years of follow-up, they observed uh, their uh, rates of coronary death or non-fatal MI, shown on the y-axis. Then they further sub segregated people in this study based on the, the baseline coronary calcium score at pre-specified levels from no calcium, a calcium score of 1 to 100, a calcium score of 101 to 300, or a calcium score above 300. And the first point that I want to make from this slide is that it appears that in those who have a score of 300 or greater, there's about a 5% increase in risk for uh, coronary events above that predicted by Framingham. So it does appear that in some people this does add uh, to your risk uh, risk prediction uh, of, above and beyond that uh, obtained by Framingham. But there are a couple of other points that I want to make here too. Uh, and the first one is that it probably doesn't make any sense to do this, this test in people who already have a Framingham risk above 20%. They're people that are at high risk as identified by Framingham. As shown from this slide, they clearly have a high risk over a, period, over a long period of follow-up. And so they're going to be candidates for aggressive treatment regardless of what their coronary calcium score shows. But as importantly, I think, is the, is the point that if you have no calcium on your coronary calcium uh, score, that's not a get out of jail free card. In fact, as you can see, people who had no calcium still had risk at the level that would be predicted by the Framingham score. Why is that? It's probably because while calcium is a component of plaques, it's probably not the most important component of plaques in determining their risk for rupture. Those components include uh, the content of inflammatory cells, macrophages, and lipid, both of which uh, probably make, uh, make plaques unstable and more prone to rupture and cause uh, clinical coronary events. So uh, I, I, I think a concern about this test is it shouldn't be used inappropriately, and people shouldn't get the impression from it that if they have no calcium, they have no risk. There are other uh, issues associated with this too. Of course, it's, it's expensive, it's not widely available, and it does expose people to some radiation risk. So, so I think there are some uh, downsides to this, and I'm not trying to advocate at all uh, widespread use of it. But uh, one thing that I think was, was nicely done in this paper is to demonstrate uh, that this really did uh, increase, uh, add to uh, 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 Framingham predicted uh, coronary heart disease uh, risk, risk. And that's shown on this slide by looking at uh, what are called receiver operating characteristic curves. So ROC curves uh, are designed to compare the sensitivity and the specificity of the test for accurately classifying the presence or absence of disease. So a perfect test would be both 100% sensitive, in other words, it wouldn't miss any uh, people who had disease, and it would be 100% specific in that it would not incorrectly classify people as having disease when they didn't have it. So a perfect test would actually have a, have a curve shaped like this and have an area under the curve of 1. In contrast, a perfectly worthless test or a useless test would have an area under the curve of 0.50. It's basically a coin toss. So what are shown then uh, also on this slide are, first of all, the ROC curve for the Framingham risk score alone. The, RO, the area under the curve for Framingham is 0.63. So it clearly does offer increased predictive value over a coin toss. But if the calcium score is added to Framingham risk, the uh, area under the curve is shifted further up and to the left, indicating that the test does have uh, further uh, prognostic value over Framingham score alone. <coughs> now on the other hand, neither, neither of these 
test, neither Framingham or Framingham plus coronary calcium, is a perfect test. Because, and so that is one of the reasons that has led people to try to identify other markers of risk that could be done readily, uh, non-invasively in the clinic or uh, clinical lab. So what, one of the uh, things that people have spent a lot of time focusing on is C-reactive protein. What is C-reactive protein? It's an acute phase protein that's made by the liver in response to a variety of inflammatory stresses. Uh, and so if we think that inflammation is a component, an important component of plaques that might lead to their risk of rupture, maybe uh, looking at a serum marker that indicates the presence of inflammation might uh, identify people at increased risk. Well, the fact that it's an acute phase uh, protein is both perhaps an advantage but also a disadvantage because there is a lot of biological variability in plasma CRP levels in humans. And this was emphasized by a study that was published uh, um, now uh, uh, two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago from Toronto. What was done in this study was to look at 70 people who had stable coronary disease and to classify their uh, risk uh, based on their, uh, their CRP levels. And the AHA and CDC have identified three uh, levels, cutoff levels of CRP that uh, identify people at high risk. Those are people with CRP levels above three. Uh, people at intermediate risk, those are people with CRP levels between one and three. And those that are at low risk, people whose CRPs are below one. And uh, on the graph, you can see the distribution of people among the different CDC AHA risk classifications at baseline and at one month of follow-up. Now it's important to note that in that one month interval, there were no changes in medications, no change in clinical status of these patients, but there was quite a bit of shifting among these groups. Uh, so much so that uh, fully 40% of patients changed their CRP risk category over one month of follow-up. And again, this was with no change in their clinical status and no change in their medications. So my first concern is that a test that has that degree of biological variability uh, makes, uh, makes it very difficult to use that test for clinical decision making. And that's one of the reasons that I don't use that this test in my practice. Here's the other reason, is there are a number of studies uh, in uh, this, uh, on the next two slides I'll show you one, uh, in which it doesn't appear that CRP adds significantly to uh, risk estimates obtained by using traditional cardiovascular risk factors. Here's uh, here data from a study from the ERIC cohort. This is the atherosclerosis risk in communities cohort. And it includes almost 16,000 adults who've been followed since the late 80s. So they've had a lot of time to uh, uh, observe these people and see uh, which ones, you know, count up uh, clinical events occurring in this population. They then performed uh, coronary heart disease risk modeling using the traditional risk factors or using the traditional risk factors plus one or more of 19 inflammatory markers, including CRP. But what they found is that uh, CRP, when added to traditional risk factors, increased the area under the curve by only 0.0003 non-significant, both statistically and uh, I think you probably agree, likely clinically. And that's uh, demonstrated, uh, I think, quite uh, dramatically on this slide. This shows uh, uh, men uh, divided into decile, risk deciles based on their uh, modeling using traditional risk factors. And then on the y-axis is the uh, observed event rates, uh, both for uh, the basic risk factors in the black uh, symbols and for the black basic risk factors plus CRP in the open symbols. And you can see for men, the uh, risk estimates from the model with or without CRP are uh, essentially superimposed. And for women, they're almost exactly superimposed. So uh, I think in uh, studies done outside of the city of Boston, generally <laughs> CRP does not appear to add much uh, to traditional uh, cardiovascular risk prediction. Well, that's okay, but I mean, there are a number of other biomarkers that we could look at. So what if, so is it possible that looking at a combination of biomarkers might uh, do the trick and, and allow us to better classify people at risk? Uh, 
So here's another study that was published just last December in New England Journal from the Framingham Offspring Cohort. And at one of the Framingham Offspring visits, they measured uh, 10 biomarkers, C-reactive protein, a number of uh, three other biomarkers biomar associated with increased thrombosis risk, uh, fibrinogen, D-dimer, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, uh, two, uh, two natriuretic peptides that are released by the heart, um, two components of the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, aldosterone and renin. They also looked at homocysteine, and they also finally looked at the urinary albumin uh, to creatinine ratio, so a measure of urinary albumin excretion. Uh, they obtained these uh, levels on about 3,200 participants, and they had uh, a follow total follow-up of over seven years. And they looked at the additive risk prediction for death or first cardiovascular event uh, and adjusted for these, these important cardiovascular risk covariates. So what was found in terms of the area under the curves, uh, so first of all, the area under the curves were calculated for death and for uh, first cardiovascular event using just age and gender alone. And as you can see, uh, age and gender are actually pretty strong risk factors for cardiovascular disease. In fact, age is probably the strongest uh, cardiovascular risk factor uh, in Framingham. But they're not terribly modifiable. Now, what if you, <laughs> well, in, ex in certain extreme circumstances, perhaps one is. But, uh, w and then for Framingham risk uh, alone, um, actually they had an area under the curve that was pretty good uh, for death, 0.80 and uh, 0.76 for uh, first cardiovascular event. And then finally, if they added uh, Framingham uh, multi-markers to Framingham risk score, uh, there was a modest increase in, uh, in the area under the curve. But these increases above Framingham risk score alone were, uh, were not statistically significant. I should mention that the multi-markers that they adjusted for for death uh, were those that were found in univariate analyses to, to be significantly associated, and they included BNP, uh, urinary albumin excretion, CRP, homocysteine, and renin, and then for uh, first cardiovascular event, BNP and albumin creatinine ratio. But again, addition of these factors to uh, Framingham risk score uh, added uh, in, uh, imperceptibly, really, to uh, the ability to predict risk for death or first cardiovascular event. Now, one of the complaints for, uh, that's been made about area under the curve is that perhaps it's insensi relatively insensitive to looking at the additional uh, benefit of new markers. So another way of looking at that is to, to uh, whether or not it adds to risk, is to look at the percentage of people that are reclassified by adding these new markers to Framingham risk score. So when you think about it, there are people who, whose risk could be uh, reclassified upward or downward uh, by the addition of the new factors. And of those people whose risk is reclassified upward, some of those could be appropriately reclassified upwards, others inappropriately reclassified upwards. And of those whose risk was uh, uh, reclassified downward, that uh, reclassification also could be appropriate or inappropriate. So one of the things you want to look at is the net reclassification rate. You can see that overall, though, that the uh, risk uh, risk didn't change for the vast majority of patients in this cohort. And overall, the net correct reclassification using adding these multi-markers to Framingham score was less than 1%. So that was statistically insignificant, I think, certainly from a clinical standpoint. That's an insignificant reclassification of risk using these additional tests above Framingham. Now, what about uh, uh, lipid variables? The standard lipid variables that are used in Framingham score are uh, total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol. Uh, but uh, there, it is possible to measure the proteins on lipoprotein particles, not just their cholesterol content. And so that's what's done by measuring ApoB and ApoA1. So one of the reasons that people have been interested in looking at apolipoproteins uh, to see whether they're better predictors of risk is based on uh, the observation that LDL cholesterol is not a terribly uh, uh, powerful risk factor in some important groups. Uh, there, it's, it's a particularly poor risk marker in many studies in women. And uh, in some studies have shown uh, that, that uh, LDL cholesterol has very little uh, uh, effect on risk in 
uh, in women uh, as compared to other li lipid risk markers. And in people who have insulin resistance, as I'll show you on a subsequent slide, there are reasons why LDL levels can be uh, low and give you a, 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 false, uh, a false sense of the degree to which those patients have lipid-associated risk. So the idea behind looking at uh, apolipoproteins is this, that uh, there's one apolipoprotein B molecule on each of the so-called atherogenic lipoproteins, VLDL, IDL, and LDL. And so that if you measure ApoB level, then you get a, an, a, an estimate of the absolute atherogenic uh, lipoprotein particle number. And then conversely, ApoA1 is the major protein on the good cholesterol, the anti-atherogenic cholesterol, HDL. So that if one measures apolipoprotein A1 levels, you'd get a good uh, estimate of the number of anti-atherogenic uh, HDL particles. So a study was just published three months ago in uh, JAMA, which looked at using uh, the cholesterol uh, fractions versus apolipoproteins in, again, the Framingham uh, offspring uh, cohort. Uh, in this uh, study, they included over 3,300 individuals, and they had 15 years of follow-up, uh, and looked at the risk prediction for coronary heart disease event by using the uh, non-lipid Framingham risk factors, and then adding in either the total to HDL cholesterol ratio or the apolipoprotein B to apolipoprotein A1 ratio. So, if you think about it, this, I'm trying to just, uh, summarize on this slide how these different lipoprotein classification schemes work, uh, with apologies to John Brunzel and uh, people. This is a little bit of an Oprah simplification. But really what's done when we talk about uh, VLDL or very low-density lipoprotein, low-density lipoprotein LDL, or high-density lipoprotein, we're talking about the amount of cholesterol in various density fractions of uh, cholesterol uh, obtained by uh, spinning the, uh, cholester the cholesterol uh, lipoprotein particles in an ultracentrifuge. So it's just a measure of the amount of cholesterol in each of these fractions. It doesn't really tell us particle number. Um, on contrast, in contrast, as I mentioned on the previous slide, if we measure apolipoprotein B, there's one apolipoprotein B molecule on each atherogenic lipoprotein particle. So if we measure ApoB, it might be a, a good uh, measure of the total amount of atherogenic uh, uh, lipoprotein. And, there, and that, again, if we measure ApoA1, perhaps that's a good way of measuring um, the total amount of ather anti-atherogenic uh, particles. Now, here's why uh, LDL Here's an example of why LDL uh, isn't, uh, doesn't seem to be as good a risk uh, predictor. And that is that, it's v that VLDL particles are made by the liver, but then LDL particles are generated in the plasma from VLDL particles through the action of an enzyme, lipoprotein lipase, or LPL, which uh, hydrolyzes the triglycerides in the triglyceride-rich VLDL fraction. Now, the problem is that there are some common risk factors associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease that block the action of LP LPL. That means that uh, triglycerides and cholesterol accumulate in the VLDL fraction, uh, so the amount of that lipoprotein goes up. But because there's this block in the, order, the normal transition of cholesterol in the VLDL particles to the LDL particles, the actual amount of cholesterol in LDL particles decreases. So that's why I say that if you just look at LDL alone in people with insulin resistance syndromes, you underestimate the total amount of atherogenic lipoprotein present. Another problem that happens in these patients is that, because, uh, that there's a reciprocal relationship between the amount of these triglyceride-rich uh, VLDL particles and the amount of uh, HDL particles, so that as VLDL triglycerides and the amount of VLDL cholesterol goes up, uh, HDL cholesterol levels go down. So um, in this situation, if you're looking at LDL, you could be misled. But because uh, ApoB has one part <coughs> molecule per particle, if you looked at ApoB, you'd still get an accurate reflection of the total amount of atherogenic uh, particles. So um, with, that, uh, with that said, what happens if you substitute ApoB to A1 
for total HDL cholesterol in the Framingham population. Well, this slide shows uh, in uh, women and men, there's uh, very little addition to the area under the curve obtained by substituting the APOBA1 ratio for total to HDL cholesterol. Uh, and uh, in terms of the reclassification rate, the net correct reclassification rate in this study using apolipoproteins uh, was only 0.1%. Again, both uh, statistically and I think you'll agree clinically uh, uh, non-significant. Now, um, why, does it, why is it that if, if there's su such a dramatic effect on LDL levels of these insulin resistance syndromes, why is it uh, that uh, the to total to HDL cholesterol ratio still seems to perform pretty well in terms of predicting risk? And the reason for that probably uh, lies in the fact that, um, that uh, the, the uh, total, cholesterol, total to HDL cholesterol ratio goes up in proportion uh, in a population's to uh, the extent of uh, insulin resistance. There are a number of studies that demonstrate that this is just one that Lisa Tanik, uh, from, uh, who was uh, at University of Washington when she published this two years ago, uh, uh, showed. And that is to look at people who uh, were categorized as lean um, or obese and who are categorized by formal uh, intravenous glucose, uh, excuse me, formal uh, insulin clamp techniques as either insulin sensitive or insulin resistant. And as you can see, that in people who are lean and insulin sensitive, the average total to HDL cholesterol ratio was 3.2. If they're lean but insulin resistant, uh, it was increased to 4. And if they were both obese and insulin resistant, probably reflecting a greater total degree of insulin resistant, the, that group had the highest total to HDL cholesterol ratio. And uh, many of the inflammatory biomarkers that have been studied, like CRP, also are heavily affected by the degree of insulin resistance. So as you can see on the right-hand graph, again, as you go from lean insulin sensitive group to the lean insulin resistant group to the obese insulin resistant group, there's a dramatic increase in uh, uh, average CRP levels. So if total to HDL cholesterol level uh, ratio and CRP levels both are increased uh, by insulin resistance, that means they co-vary. And so that if you measure one, you'll probably get most of the information that's uh, obtained by looking at the other. Here's another slide that uh, I think uh, helps to emphasize that point. This is a, a study from, from Boston, uh, from the uh, Nurses Health Study, looking at whether or not CRP added to uh, cardiovascular risk assessment. And what's done on the x-axis is they divided women in this study into quintiles based on their total to HDL cholesterol ratio, so uh, first through fifth quintile. And then within those quintiles, they've looked at uh, observed risk based on, on the y-axis based on their uh, CRP levels less than 1 in white, uh, 1 to 3 in uh, light uh, blue, and uh, 3 or greater in dark blue. And I think what you can see here is that there really was no uh, prognostic value for looking at CRP levels in two of these five uh, quintile, uh, quintiles. And really, the biggest, the dr most dramatic effect on risk in this uh, slide is what happens when you go from the lowest to the highest quintile of total HDL cholesterol levels. There's a seven-fold increase in risk associated with that change. So again, emphasizing, I think, the fact that CRP levels probably aren't telling you much over and above what we uh, obtained by looking at total to HDL cholesterol ratios because they're both heavily influenced by obesity and insulin resistance. So uh, finally, what about framing him, him risk scoring? Um, if it works, why don't we do it? Well, how often do physicians calculate framing him risk score? And I couldn't find any uh, big studies on this, but we did a semi-scientific survey, uh, or a semi-scientific survey was done uh, in April of this year at Cardiology Grand Rounds uh, at a major academic medical center that will remain <laughs> nameless. There were about 70 people in the audience. And they were asked this question. How many of you have calculated the Framingham risk score on a patient in the last week? Now, this is a group of cardiologists and cardiology fellows. So how often do you think we did that? There were two people that raised their hands, so it was less than 3%. Uh, so that's not a very 
that's not very uh, high utilization of a scoring system that seems to be a good, pretty good predictor of risk. And what, uh, why is that? I think because it's not terribly user friendly. Here's an example of the uh, Framingham uh, point score sheet uh, for men. So what you do with this sheet is you look at the age, the systolic blood pressure, whether or not they're uh, treated for hypertension, uh, whether or not they smoke, uh, what their HDL levels are, what their total cholesterol levels are. You have to get the right sheet because there's a separate sheet for men and a separate sheet for women. And at the end of all that, you have to do some math. And I think that's, you know, for people in, uh, you know, in a busy practice uh, where you're looking at a risk for a chronic disease and people come, uh, come into your office with acute problems that you really have to deal with, I think it's not hard to understand how uh, assessment of risk for chronic diseases uh, may uh, fall by the wayside uh, even in cardiology practices. So um, I'd like to make a suggestion that perhaps there's a way that we can improve this. Perhaps it could be automated. You might recognize this, uh, this order sheet on the left-hand side. Uh, and uh, I've highlighted the, the box that one checks for uh, fasting lipid panel. And I'm taking a cue here for what uh, the laboratory medicine department at UWMC has done, for example, for cal calculating creatinine clearance. You know, I mean, it, creatinine clearance is clearly a better, predict, uh, better indicator of the degree of renal dysfunction than creatinine levels alone. And it can be easily calculated using a, a, a formula, either Cockroft-Galt formula or the uh, MDRD formula. That actually, that's not, that's not quite as easy. Uh, but it's rare, rarely done. And I think one of the nice advance, nicest advances I've seen here in uh, laboratory testing uh, from a clinical standpoint in the last uh, few years is the fact that uh, creatinine clearance now is routinely calculated uh, and on our patients. Well, what would it take uh, to also now calculate Framingham scores? You'd, al you'd have to also fill in uh, systolic blood pressure. Somebody would have to check whether or not their patient is being treated for hypertension and whether or not they're currently smoking. The other two risk factors, age and gender, are available already from the demographics in the, in the computer system. So maybe if, we, if this were automated a little bit more, uh, it might be, uh, might be more widely available and perhaps we could use it really to, for our ultimate goal, which is to try to improve the care of our patients. So in summary, uh, Framingham Risk Score really may, remains the cardiovascular uh, risk uh, gold standard there are some uh, issues with the Framingham scoring system, uh, but as I, I think, I hope I've shown you, there is, hasn't been a lot that's been done in the last few years that's improved dramatically on risk prediction from that. Uh, coronary calcium scoring uh, may add to Framingham risk prediction, but it's important to remember that a zero score does not decrease risk, and I'm concerned that that's probably how a lot of patients and practitioners uh, use this in, in the community. Uh, that biomarkers, especially uh, CRP, have a lot of biological variability that limits their clinical utility. They don't appear to add to traditional risk, even in combination. And uh, it, many of these, uh, particularly CRP, fibrinogen, uh, and, and uh, PI-1, uh, tend to co-vary with obesity and insulin resistance, resistance as does total to HDL cholesterol, which probably accounts for why it, measuring these things don't add much to uh, risk assessed by measuring total to ACL cholesterol as we do anyway. And then finally, uh, ApoB to A1 measurements uh, uh, probably don't add either terribly much to Framingham risk, at least in uh, the Framingham offspring study. There may be some additional studies coming out in the near future from other larger cohorts that, that may change our assessment of that risk. But at the present time, I don't think we can make a strong case that measuring these uh, uh, adds to traditional risk. And their measurements, as opposed to measurements of total and HDL cholesterol, measurements of these, uh, these uh, factors aren't widely standardized uh, in labs across the country. And that finally, perhaps maybe there are some simple things that could be done to facilitate the use of Framingham risk scoring in clinical practice. So thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Dr. O'Brien, to repeat the question for our uh, listeners on via teleconferencing because they've asked me to do that. So, any questions for Dr. O'Brien? Dr. Rainey. There are websites you can go to to get the estimated GFR by the MDRD equations by putting in the variables. 
is there a similar website for the Framingham Risk Score? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, so the question is, are, are there websites that you can go to to calculate Framingham Risk Score? Um, actually, the NHLBI uh, uh, website, nhlbi.nih.gov, um, has downloadable risk calculators. Uh, this is an Excel spreadsheet that you can download from them, and you can see you can you can uh, enter in uh, uh, you know the risk factors: gender, age, total cholesterol, HDL, systolic blood pressure, and so forth. And at the bottom, not only does it give you a uh, an estimated risk, uh, this it, that that risk is shown graphically here in red on the bottom, and though uh, you can't read it, uh, I'm sure, but the blue bar and the green bars represent respectively are what the risk could be if uh, total cholesterol levels were lower, HDL levels were higher by pre-specified amounts, uh, and blood pressure was lower. Uh, and then you can also see the effect of uh, uh, adding, uh, beginning or stopping smoking on risk. Uh, stopping smoking on risk. Actually, in this gentleman who's 75 years old, it didn't add much actually to his risk <laughs> when he started smoking. But that's probably, that, again, that emphasizes that, that really that uh, age is a very powerful risk factor. But I think it's, it's, it's kind of instructive to look at this person. He's a guy who's 75. His total cholesterol is 232. He actually has quite a bit of HDL cholesterol, 57. Uh, blood pressure is not terrible. It's 150, but, you know, so that's not normal, but it's not terrible. <laughs> Yet he has an 18% uh, 10-year risk for death or non-fatal MI. And moreover, if he were able to lower what the green bar represents in this particular individual is uh, that he lowers his total cholesterol down to less than 160, which is readily, readily doable with uh, stat, uh, you know, uh, potent mo statin monotherapy. Um, and uh, that translates into fully uh, you know, a 33% decrease in his estimated risk for coronary disease, even in somebody who's 60, uh, 75 years old. So it's surprising, actually, when you start to do, apply this in your patients, how, how often you can actually have uh, uh, misclassified their risk just by kind of eyeballing. So I, so I really do believe there's some, some significant value in doing this uh, more widely in our patients. Yes. Uh, I, I have two questions, Kevin, related to lab medicine's reporting data. You, know, you suggested one thing. The first question relates to non-HDL cholesterol. You know, one of the, some of the issues that you talked about might be answered by reporting non-HDL cholesterol, which is just the total minus the HDL, to represent the atherogenic lipoproteins and hypertriglyceridemia people. You, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yes, I will. Um, so uh, John, Dr. Brunzel has asked, well, what if we looked at, uh, what if we just went ahead and looked at uh, non-HDL uh, cholesterol? Would that um, solve a lot of the problems uh, that we have? Uh, what non-HDL cholesterol represents is it's just the total cholesterol minus the HDL. So it does give you an estimate of the uh, ather total amount of cholesterol in atherogenic particles. But you know, John, one of the things that's very interesting is that, that if you look at the total cholesterol to HDL ratio as opposed to the non-HDL to HDL ratio, you might think that non-HDL to HDL ratio would be better Except that when you do the math, the non-HDL to HDL ratio is the total cholesterol to HDL ratio minus one. And so actually in these studies, um, that was a revelation to me. Too. <laughs> so actually in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the JAMA art, uh, article uh, from three months ago, they did also calculate risk using a non-HDL to HDL ratio. And in retrospect, not surprising when you look at the underlying math, the area under the curves were identical if you use non-HDL to HDL ratio as if you use total but I'm HDL. About, you know, in people who are hypertriglyceridemic, ATP3 talks about using LDL and non-HDL cholesterol in those that are hypertriglyceridemic, forgetting the ratio. I mean, actually looking at the lipoprotein that's atherogenic. It would be just, it would be just another line on the report at no cost once the equation was plugged into the computer. So, so so your point is, well, why couldn't they just uh, report the non-HDL uh, as a value uh, in the in the uh, lab? And, and I think that's certainly worth uh, worth considering. I, I think 
you did you mentioned also though that that the guidelines the ATP3 guidelines tend to focus on LDL levels and I think I hope uh, you can see uh, you know, from some of the data presented here that that's probably doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it makes sense in that the you know LDL was first identified the, the lipoprotein that was first identified as being most strongly associated with risk, increased risk, and uh, it makes sense in this uh, from the standpoint that the dr the drugs that we have available to treat uh, lipid disorders uh, are the statins, uh, the most potent ones, the statins, are primarily uh, drugs that lower LDL cholesterol levels. But, um, but again, I think that by focusing on LDL in the guidelines, we do uh, misclassify risk in many of our patients. And I think it's very interesting that, to look back at Framingham that years ago they identified that looking at total cholesterol and total to HDL ratio was actually a better predictor than to, to focus on LDL. That, I have a second question, more addressed to the faculty of lab medicine. On the lab report, if you look at total cholesterol, if it's above 200, it's reported as high. Yet a person can have an HDL of 100 and never get coronary disease, and that makes that accounts for the high total cholesterol. Why not remove any evaluation on what total cholesterol is, whether it's normal, high, or borderline, or whatever? Just just delete it because many times people get sent to us with total. <coughs> cholesterol is of 230, 240, and they have an HDL of 140, and they'll never get heart disease. And uh, many physicians are making uh, the, wrong, the, wrong, uh, the wrong decisions based on that number that you don't have to make a qualification for. So, so John asked a question directed towards the lab medicine faculty. I'll repeat, and then I'll actually try to take a stab and then <laughs> see if you, if you want to handle it. And, and that is that, you know, that in our lab, if the total cholesterol level is above 200, that's, re that's flagged as high. Even though some peop people may have uh, an HDL, for example, of 100, in which case that total cholesterol of level of 200 isn't uh, associated with increased risk. I'm, I'm sure that what's happening is you're just using a, you're picking a cutoff based on what the guidelines say is a borderline high level of total cholesterol is 200. So your practice, your reporting system reflects uh, the guide, what the guidelines tell us. But Except they went one step further. They called it high, not borderline. Well, yeah, but I think, I, but I guess what I had, what I'd wonder is if, if it might actually be helpful to 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 report report uh, to flag total to HDL cholesterol ratios, which are also reported out, but to flag those that are all that that really are high. And I think that would, uh, you know, that might obviate some of the problem that you. That, that you uh, mentioned, that if, if somebody might have a high total cholesterol, but if their HDL is high, their ratio is going to be normal. Uh, I Mike? Just, I would just, sorry, I'm sure it's kind of a large topic, but I'm sure uh, Dr. Wenner or Dr. Rainey would be happy to meet to discuss the issues. It can be hard. People have to come to consensus on what they want. We get asked to change reference ranges all the time, and because then a big fight breaks out, and we're left with usually what we have. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, but we're happy. We're happy to look at occasionally. We do change, and we change critical values, etc. Um, other questions? Yes, Tim. Okay, I, my my question is, is using one using infectious disease as a model, infectious disease or vaccination, where there's a clear intervention with clear outcomes. What's your sense, based on your experience and all these studies, that have, to me it seems like we're which we're chasing the phantom, phantom. You know, it's like there's all these markers, but none of them are as none of them as are as important as age and gender, which are which you can't change. So, if I said, show me the money, what's, what's your sense of what what's important from from a, from an interventional public health type standpoint? Well, what's the so the question is, uh, which, which intervention, I mean, right. age and gender aren't modifiable. Which of these markers are, are, are the th things that are the most important to target right. uh, from a public health standpoint? Um, and so that's kind of the, you know, uh, God grant me the wiz wisdom to <laughs> know the things, that, recognize the things I can change, those that I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference or something like that. But so, you, well, you can't, it's true you can't change age. Uh, I think, uh, you know, is uh, that the things that we've identified as modifiable risk factors, particularly uh, dyslipidemias, uh, 
high triglyceride, uh, excuse me, high, high cholesterol, high total cholesterol, low HDL, uh, blood pressure, smoking. Those are modifiable risk factors, and in many patients, modifying them uh, aggressively can dramatically increase risk. I mean, I, I mean, I showed you the example of this elderly man who has a very high risk, and a lot of that's associated with age, but that it would be possible to lower his risk by fully a third with simple interventions targeting his cholesterol, his dyslipidemia, and, uh, and uh, his blood pressure. So, so again, I mean, you know, we, there is proven benefit to, to uh, modifying those risk factors uh, that for which we have interventions, and so I think we should do more of it. Uh, but I think that, that the application of those therapies, because they're costly and they, and, uh, they carry their own sets of risks, uh, should be ra ration those, those therapies should be rationally applied, and I think using things like these scoring systems help us to do that. Why don't I ask the final questions? My questions are: What happened to CRP? Everybody was very excited about it, and there was a 2003 guideline for the American Heart Association. What happened? And number two, what do we? One question we get from family practitioners is that patients are pressuring them to order these extended panels, like VAP testing. What What should we? Uh, how could we guide them? So uh, Mike's questions were two. First, what happened to CRP? And I think this, that I think there are, there, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit at one extreme in terms of, uh, uh, perhaps in terms of believing that CRP is not a very helpful, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, it used to be a small crowd and it's, it's becoming, <laughs> becoming a, a more, bigger and bigger, mainly because more data is accumulating and data from uh, a variety of different places. Uh, and, and so that so that we're getting also a better understanding of what factors affect that and how they covaria with other things that we're already measuring. And then secondly, what about these other tests that can be ordered? Uh, the lipoprotein fractionation. There's the Berkeley Heart Labs test, which costs about four or five hundred dollars, and the VAP test, which is less expensive but also gives you a lipoprotein uh, fractionation. And you know, I. I just don't see how they're going to add much to risk. For example, um, if you have if you have a triglyceride above 150, you don't really need to get a Berkeley Heart Lab test to tell you that you have small dense LDL. There's an 80% likelihood that you have small dense LDL if your triglycerides are above 150. And uh, moreover, I mean, what are we going to do to change those things? We're, we're going to apply the therapies that we already have available, and we're going to hopefully treat the levels uh, that are specified uh, in guidelines or the, so that we're applying these thera therapies at least somewhat rationally. So I don't tend to get those tests. Um, John, you may have a, a different uh, view about that. No, he's shaking his head no, so, <laughs> so I feel validated here. Thank you. We do the graded gel electrophoresis for LDL size in my lab. I run the lipid clinic. I never do either one of them on my patients. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need them. So, so John made the comment. Yeah, the right John made the comment that he does he does calculate uh, LDL size uh, on, as as a research tool, right, right, right. but that he doesn't order it clinically in the in the lipid clinic. I want to thank Dr. Ryan for individual questions. Maybe you'll stick around for a few minutes. Thanks for having me.